Known fact about my guest today: Not only does he sing like a rock star, but he is also apparently a shark of a poker player. Welcome, Anthony Rapp. Everything's okay. My guest today is Anthony Rapp, who began acting professionally at the age of six. He has had a film and theater career that has spanned decades. His film career began with the adventures of babysitting. Adventures in babysitting, Alana. That's so crazy because I've been looking up the adventures of babysitting and nothing comes up. See, that's <laughs> that, there's that's why you see. I think of it though more like it's more of babysitting. Is it too? Is Chris Columbus alive? He's alive. Yeah. <laughs> could we call him? I think it might be interesting to see if you could get a whole new generation into it if it's of babysitting. Sure. Well, they are remaking it on the Disney Channel. They are? Or if, I don't know if they've already done it or if it's coming out, but... Uh, a series or a No, film? I think just a, like a made-for-Disney Channel movie, Adventures in Babysitting, updated. I think it's going to be very different. Well, first of all, it's called In Babysitting. Yes. So already it's different than the film I'm referencing. Yes, of course. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, you know what? His film career began <laughs> with the adventures in babysitting. Some of the more popular titles that he has been a part of include Dazed and Confused, School Ties, A Beautiful Mind, Road Trip, Six Degrees of Separation, which he also appeared in the Broadway production, and the film version of Rent. And of course, Anthony became a global star after doing Rent the Musical on Broadway. Most recently, he's been starring in If Then with his Rent co-star, Adina Menzel. He also starred as Charlie Brown in the Broadway revival of You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Who else was in that? Roger Bart, Kristen Chenoweth, B.D. Wong, Stanley Wayne Mathis. Mm. There's there's someone you're there's someone you're not thinking of. Who? Help me out. Um, she is in this room. These are little known facts that now you know. Alana Levine. No, but listen, this is, I'm getting to some more beautiful stuff about you. And then we'll, obviously the next 40 minutes will be about me. But if we could just do your resume and then talk more about me, it's going to be perfect. Anthony wrote a beautiful memoir called Without You. And he also recorded a CD with all of his original songs, the title of which is Look Around. He is an actor. He's a singer. He's an author. He's an activist. He's the Charlie to my Lucy, and he is my friend. So welcome, Anthony Rapp. Thank you, Lana Levine. I am so thrilled to have you here. I also should mention in that long list of accomplishments that you also host a podcast called The Clubhouse, mm-hmm. which is uh, something I want to plug because it's fantastic if you're a fan of baseball or if you're just a fan of Anthony Rapp. It's really fun to watch him in a whole other genre, talking about something that's not theater but equally close to his heart. Yeah. Would that be fair to say? Sure, yes, thank you. have a lot of interests. I do. A lot of passions. Yes. And I feel like it's so important to have lots of interests and passions outside of showbiz because showbiz is a crazy world to try to only live. That's why so many people who are in showbiz can go crazy. Right. Because they don't have enough outside of showbiz. I mean, you don't seem crazy at all. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. (laughs) You Um, seem amazing. (laughs) No, I mean, after, this is a room with padded walls, so it probably looks familiar to you. Yes. I want to talk to you a little bit about your early days. You were on stage on Broadway at the age of 10. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Go Hmm. back a little bit with me and our listeners to young Anthony in Illinois. I was born in Chicago, grew up outside Chicago in Joliet. My mom was a single mother nurse. I had my older brother, Adam, older sister, Anne, so it was the three of us. Were you aware of her challenges, or did she find a way to no, wrap it wanted. in bows? My memory is that she would s- share with us a little bit of the, just the realistic situations, like right. if we couldn't afford to do X, Y, or Z. But it wasn't like a doom and gloom situation. So one summer, she got a job at a summer camp in northeastern Pennsylvania. 
being the camp nurse. Oh, that's cool. Um, so the three of us went to the camp for the summer because she was working there. Do you remember how old you were at the time? I was time? six. So technically, when you said I started professionally at six, I didn't. I started professionally at nine, but my first performance was when I was six. The little kids could do The Wizard of Oz. So I auditioned, and I got cast as the Cowardly Lion. I hadn't ever taken a singing lesson at that point, or I, I didn't have taken any classes or anything. I think I'd been to one show at that point. My mom uh, took me to a production of The Sound of Music when I was pretty young. And it's like so young that the ushers were like, we don't think he should go in. Right. And she's like, no, he'll be good. And, right. and I was completely you were fine. enraptured by it. Okay, so you went to camp. You pissed a lot of kids off because sure. you were kind of swept in and got the cowardly line. And they're like, we've been coming here for 12 years, but whatever. The next summer, the counselors did a production of Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. Yes. And they cast me as a kid as Snoopy. Wait a minute. So you kind of cheated a little by the time we got to You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown on Broadway. You'd done a little research exactly. for 20. Okay. Exactly. You had a little edge on everybody So I played else. Snoopy at seven with the counselors playing, you know, the other roles. After the second summer, after doing those two shows. Where you swept the summer season by yes. playing. <laughs> I came home to Joliet. I found an ad in the local Joliet Herald News advertising auditions for a local community theater production of a musical version of A Christmas Carol. And I called and scheduled myself an audition. It was never any like thinking of like a career. I didn't know what that was. I didn't right. think about showbiz, nothing. I just knew I loved doing it. And I found that I was an enterprising young kid. I was very precocious. And, and then my mom was incredibly supportive. So from that, I did more community theater. And then there was a director that I did like three or four shows with at his community theater who recommended to her that I auditioned for professional work in Chicago. And I was fortunate enough to start getting work. My first my first equity job, my first professional job was in the first national tour of Evita. So how did you get a major motion picture well, at such a young age? I actually don't remember this, but I auditioned for The Shining back in the day. And apparently I was in the running, but they were concerned I was a little too young because mm-hmm. I was very, very young mm-hmm. at that point. But a big leap happened when I got cast in a play called Precious Sons here in New York with Judith Ivey and Ed Harris. I've been acting for all these years, but it was the first time I really started to learn like the big sort so of So are you how old are you? Things. 14. Are you te- 14. 14. And I got, you know, really nice reviews and I got nominated for a Drama Desk Award and I won an Outer Critics Circle Award and I got a New York agent. Later that year they were auditioning Adventures in Babysitting in Chicago. So you go back home. Yeah, and go back to high school. And once you started getting movies, did you go back to school in between? Yeah, I always was going back to school. And when I did Adventures in Babysitting, I was 15. My father's second wife uh, was a lawyer, and she helped get me emancipated so I wouldn't have to work under child labor laws. They would have cast someone over 18 and just have them play a kid? Yeah. So, I mean, I've had a weird life. I just have had an unusual life. All along the way, my mother was just very, very supportive. And she, I mean, she had a tough upbringing. She was the eldest of 13 kids. There was not a lot of support. And I think she really pledged herself to be as supportive as possible to what her kids wanted to do with their lives and to make it all possible. And Adam was like avidly an athlete and he was a high level athlete. He, He won a basketball scholarship to college and mom was certainly supportive of his athletic endeavors. But I do know that like going to a game didn't mean as much to her as going to a play. I think that one is drawn to the things they're drawn to. And I think you and your mom shared that in common. Yeah. You're wanting to do it and her loving being around it yeah. and feeding off the artists. I mean, all of it kind of worked in conjunction. And I think that, you know, clearly all of you really have found beautiful, full lives. Yes. And she was so at the center of that. I guess it's kind of extraordinary to me, raising kids myself now, I keep circling back to thinking about you at that age and having that kind of confidence, which some of it can be learned and some of it is just what you're born with. Your voice is one of the most uniquely special voices to listen to. And I've had the pleasure of doing that a lot as a huge fan of yours. When did you understand that you had a gift as a singer and not just as an actor? I did Oliver four times as a kid, Mm -hmm. like playing Oliver in Mm -hmm. four different productions. And that's a pretty big sing. You know, like singing Where is Love and singing Who Will Buy. And I always really enjoyed that. 
So I think that was part of it, but that's a child's voice. When, when I, did your voice become the voice we know now? Um, I mean, it was. I didn't really do a musical for many years. Rent was the first musical that I'd done professionally in many years, and I was 22 when I did the workshop. So uh, I guess it was in that time, but I did not have a lot of confidence in my singing at that point, or I just didn't know... Certainly with a huge, the huge task of singing that score, I didn't know how I was going to hold up. The song you auditioned for Ren for was Losing My Religion that's by correct. R.E.M. Is that yeah, right? That's right. Uh, after I moved to New York for good in the fall of 89, not long after that, I found a, an acting class that I really loved. One of the exercises we did was called the hero exercise. And was Michael Stipe the hero? Yeah, Michael okay. Stipe was the hero. And what was heroic to me about him was his authenticity. I also love the way that he was using his stardom to talk about issues and mm-hmm. political issues. Do you think you know? that in any way played a part in your own honesty about coming out as a gay actor really early in your career, sort of looking at heroes who were very honest about who they were? That happened before that from working with Larry Kramer. And how old were you then? Uh, 21-ish. And are you one of the first people to do that? I think so. Early, yeah, I was certainly early in, you know, yeah, in New York. Yeah, especially um, to put it in fine print. Yeah, but it was important to me, and it always was. And I know it's been a lot of years since then, and I'm really, I, I'm always still glad when I see actors doing that or any kind of public figure. Sure. I mean, I think it continues to make a huge difference. I really do. I mean, my first real boyfriend, my first real relationship, I would, I, sh- I would call it, was when I was, at, I met him at NYU. I came to NYU for one semester, and we were together mm, certainly more than six months. Um, some enough time. My mom came to visit me in New York, and she met him. And that's when I came. So when I came out officially, when I claimed it for myself, too, my mother was calling her on the phone to talk to her about my about him. So that's what I say. So I was like eighteen. So I really thought about it. Like, is there a way to catch up with Anthony Rapp and not talk about Rand? Can you talk about what that is for you? I can tell you that being a part inside of it at the time. I I knew always that I was a part of something really meaningful and beautiful and special, but the question was, would it reach the level of success that I felt it deserved? You never know. Right. Anything can happen. I mean, we got mostly great reviews, but there were a couple people who didn't like it. And if if that, at the time, the way that things were going, if that particular person who didn't like it happened to write for the New York Times, I might not be having this conversation. You can't know. So I was really crossing my fingers that it was going to be met with what I felt it deserved. So the fact that it was, and what I felt it deserved, why I felt it deserved to be met with that was that I felt like everybody involved with it, from Jonathan Larson, Michael Greif, Jim Nicole, the artistic director of the New York Theater Workshop, all of the cast, everyone, we had our heart in the right place. We had our eye on telling a story that was meaningful and important and talking about things that weren't being talked about and using this medium, which can communicate, you know, music can communicate on a level that words alone can't. Mm-hmm. And those harmonies. Yeah. So the fact that then all of this, I, and I'm a pretty idealistic person. So the fact that my ideals were met with the reality and it, like not even met with, but far ex- the reality far exceeded anything like my wildest dreams and hopes of how it could be received mm-hmm. is so profoundly validating that that, uh, I don't know, it just reaches to the very core of my being. And it's why all these 20 years later, I will never, you say, you know, do we, do we want to talk without talking about it? It was a once in a lifetime situation. Yeah. And if I'm so lucky to be a part of anything, again, that has any kind of that reach, great. I mean, I won't say no. Right. But one of the things that I'm so thrilled about being not in Hamilton, and I don't know if this will make any sense, I get to, in a way, feel like what all these people have felt. Right. Because I'm such a huge fan of Hamilton, and I'm having such an experience of it. Yeah. That it it helps complete that other little piece of the puzzle for me of what rent is right because i feel the same what i feel is so much like what got reflected to me from people who saw and loved rent i know that you and adam tour together Mm -hmm. adam pascal when you guys perform together first of all is that the most fun it's really it's just it's just like wearing the most comfortable clothes in Mm -hmm. the world Mm -hmm. and it's just trust and respect and love and camaraderie and I mean, we don't talk all that often in life. He's got two kids himself, but we have this thing, this profound 
cord of energy or whatever you want to call it that just connects all of us who are part of that show. We have that. Do you, you know. have favorite songs from Rent? Uh, what You Own, for me to sing, as an audience member, when I've seen good productions of it, some of the moments that move me the most are the I'll Cover Your Reprise mm. and Will I. Mm-hmm. And uh, the finale. And the older I get and the more time on this earth I live, the more I love the finale even more and more and more. The interweaving lyric 